so if you remember, um, we were talking about um, formable steels and uh, one of the essential points um, of these formable steels uh, that we'd started with, the aluminum killed low carbon steels, AIF steels, is that um, they're soft, which is um, one of the reasons why they're formable. Um, but there is a definite trend towards uh, stronger, actually much stronger material than um, the strength levels um, we uh, started with. Um, and in order to address this, um, new steels had to be developed. Um, and we already talked about um, a couple of them where, where there is a slight increase in, uh, in strength, which is based on um, static strain aging. Those are the big hardenable steels. And uh, adding some phosphorus, which are the... Um, Rephosphorized or phosphorus containing IF steels, for instance. Um, in it, so, so you, you, for in, and, and the, the amount of strengthening that you get in, in uh, additional strength that you get in these cases is, is not substantial, right? So they will, for instance, allow you to have uh, outer body parts for cars that are less dent resistant. There are more dense resistant, excuse me. Um, so, but you don't get substantial, amount, substantial amounts of strengthening. So for that, um, you will need grades such as some of the ones that are listed here. Um, HSLA steels, which we um, have already encountered. Yeah. High strength IF steels, uh, big hardening steels we discussed dual phase steels, trip steels, and other types of uh, multi-phase steels, such as complex phase steels, um, the uh, twip steels, and we will also see that nowadays um, we are using martensitic steels to achieve very high strengths. So just about um, steels and achieving high strengths. Hmm? Um, today, if um, if you're out to buy something that has only strength, um, um, there are steel grades that give you four gigapascal. So very, very high strengths with steels, it's not a problem, yes? And if we worked a little bit harder on it, we could probably uh, make products that are five gigapascal in strength, right? So very, very high strength, it's not an issue with steels. Hmm? So the, the, the big issue is to make something that's very high strength in the right format and shape. So you can, for instance, make a car or, or a, um, a parking lot with it. Huh? Um, um, and, and you can weld it, so, uh, uh, and, and you can produce it in, in, in a reasonable amount, so uh, uh, cheaply. So that's, those are, there are plenty of other issues in, that come into, um, into uh, the situation. So for instance, with, with um, production of cars, uh, you, know, you, you need to have uh, large sheets of the material. Yes? Four gigapascal nowadays is used to make uh, uh, bridge cables, suspension cables for bridges, yes? Um, and they're uh, um, rather common in that area, certainly for these um, very large pan bridges. So formability is, is, um, is, is uh, one of the driving um, strength and formability at the same time is, is one of the, the driving um, elements of the uh, steel developments. So for instance, when you look at the car, you can see obviously the, the, the car, um, the body of the car is its own, is also the structure of the car, yes? 
it doesn't have it does have an additional frame or an, uh, um, uh, this is this design this way of design where the body of the car is also at the frame of the car um, you attach everything to this frame yes you call this monocoque uh, design of cars um, and it, uh, not all the cars are designed this way like for instance a pickup truck is designed around a frame you first build a frame like a truck yes you build a frame and on that frame you put the motor the wheels etc etc and then on top of that you put a cabin or whatever you want to that's that's a very different design here you don't have a frame on which you build the car yes the car is itself uh, the structure so you need these big uh, 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 sheets of materials yes um, you need to have uh, parts of these of the body has, has have to have uh, structural uh, of, of structural importance for instance this this beam here is of structural importance the, the this uh, um, cross member here yes this tunnel here yes but they're part of the body yes and then we you have uh, uh, closures like the hood here the doors exterior doors the, uh, the back here these are closure they're panels yes they don't have a very large structural um, uh, job to do uh, it as part of the the body of the car hmm? okay so I will have uh, in order to build a car I need the distribution of properties yes so some of the materials will have to be uh, very high strengths other ones will have to be um, uh, much can be much lower strength yes but there will be uh, they will have other um, characteristics will be needed hmm? so Again, and the problem here is that when you're looking at very high tensile strengths, so you, you say you're thinking about what we now call ultra high strength steels, yes, in uh, those are uh, steels with strengths larger than a thousand megapascal. So a, a long a way below this four gigapascal we can reach, yes, in principle. Um, um, but they're formable so that means that instead of following this downward slope where that with increasing uh, strength you get less uh, elongation um, you're able to keep a certain amount of plasticity at increasing strengths yes and we'll see how this is uh, being done hmm? All right, uh, so, um, right, so this is a, uh, an overview. You can have a look at it. And again, um, uh, when um, people design um, uh, cars, for instance, or trucks, or uh, any other uh, steel structure, um, th I've changed the slides a little bit. This comes at uh, relative towards the end of the... Um, the series of slides you find on um, E class, but that you have this, yeah. Um, this, so the, the parts have all a function and, uh, and they will uh, need different properties. For instance, when it comes to um, very high strengths, uh, will uh, you see, for instance, here, let's see, um, uh, Martin Sittic steels are probably the, 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 the highest strengths. You can see here that these B pillars, yes, these B pillars are made of uh, Martin Sittic grades, yes, and um, uh, they are um, covered. You see here, they're covered by a dual face steel, yes, and the outer body, yes, the part you actually see when you open your door, yes. Is, is made of uh, blackish, so bake hardening steel, okay? So the, the middle part of the, the B pillar has actually very strong uh, martensitic grade and then uh, covers, um, and then that's covered by a couple of other um, uh, parts, yes? They all need, these parts all need to be deep drawn, yes? 
and um, the, during press forming. Hmm? And it's all and it's, it's like this for every part. You know? So the, the, the designers can optimize the, the part and, and then get um, a car that is, for instance, safe. That is one of the reasons why these parts are Martin City grades, because if you have a side impact, yes, um, so side impact, you have the passengers are sitting here, yes, uh, you're very close to the impact. Yes, you're actually a few centimeters away from the impact. So you need to have a lot of passenger protection here. Hmm? And uh, so do you need to have very high strength uh, steels that protect the, um, the passengers. Uh, this, this, um, this is called passive safety. Hmm? You make the car, you design the car so it's safe for the, um, the, guy, the people that drive it. Hmm? And you see here uh, 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 on this uh, list, uh, for instance, what the function is of, uh, uh, for every part, what, uh, what is important, what is the import characteristic. Hmm? So let's have a look, for instance, um, well, the hang-on pa panels, that those are the panels the, which are exterior panels, yes. What is important? Their appearance, yes. They need to have you know, you have to have a steel that you can form in very different shapes so you can, you can give the designer all the freedom he or she needs to design a fancy model, yes? The car has to be dent resistant, so you will use big hardenable steel, rephosphorized steels, and high strength IF steels nowadays. Yeah. Um, uh, bumpers, yeah? Bumpers, that's what you need there is anti-intrusion, so obviously you'll, you'll go for very high strength. We use nowadays uh, HSLA steels or quench hardening uh, boron steels, those are press hardening steels. Uh, and, and there is also the option to use DP steel or trip steels. Hmm? Okay. Uh, the, the, the way the, the, the cars are designed and what part, what steels are used for what parts is Yes, okay. The, um, um, right, so, so the, the different car designers will, will use different materials. So, okay, obviously, um, not everybody makes the same choice. There's also uh, aspects of costs and material availability, yeah. okay? Uh, you may be building a car in a country, for instance, where certain uh, very high strength steels are not available, then you know, you'll have to make do with, with others, hmm? okay? So you, uh, you can see here um, uh, the, the types of strengths uh, we're, we're talking about. So uh, these uh, strengths are, are high, but you know, they're not extremely high. You know, we're talking about 600 megapascal, 1,000 megapascals, uh, that type of strength, yes? And again, the reason is uh, because we cannot um, uh, uh, easily uh, increase strength and, and, um, and keep the plasticity uh, present. Okay. Um, so let's start with the HSLA steels. So important thing with uh, HSLA steels is that you achieve strength, as you know, by... Um, uh, uh, and grain size control mainly. Hmm? You do this with your niobium additions. One of the uh, big advantages is not only that you get strength, but that you get a, um, the low carbon equivalent and, excuse me, the low carbon content, yes, allows you to have steels which are also readily weldable. So the, the uh, HSLA steels are, are widely used, not only in the automotive industry as, as high strength steels. Yeah? Um, you remember that um, how, what the trick is to uh, make the HSLA steels, that is 
you do what's called controlled rolling, yes, mm -hmm. or thermomechanical rolling, where uh, you are able to uh, control uh, the recrystallization and the grain growth between uh, different passes in the, um, in the hot strip mill. Mm -hmm. And you do this by addition of niobium, which um, really suppresses static recrystallization. So instead of having this recrystallization kinetics, you have a much longer recrystallization kinetics. And so you can accumulate uh, deformation. Hmm? And that gives you a very small um, uh, stress. Uh, excuse me, it's very small um, grains, yes? So uh, again, the niobium microalloying has, has two effects, yes? It works because of the s niobium in solution and it also works because we, the, during the deformation, we make very small niobium carbide precipitates, yes? So the solute niobium uh, uh, will suppress uh, recrystallization uh, by an effect of what we call solute drag. So the, 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 the niobium atoms travel along with moving boundaries, yes? And so they will make it harder for a, a grain boundary or a boundary between a recrystallized uh, part of a grain and a deformed part of a gamma grain, yes? Uh, they will slow down this boundary and so prevent recrystallization. Same thing with uh, particles, carbide, small carbide particles. They will do this and they will also influence the transformation, yes? Transformation will be slower. Hmm? So I get solute drag effect and the pinning of boundaries by niobium carbides. Okay? Why do we use niobium? Because niobium is very efficient at doing this, at suppressing this recrystallization. So I don't need to add too much niobium. Hmm? So if you look at the, let's look at uh, this graph here, which gives me the temperature at which we observe this recrystallization suppression in an HSLA steel, yes? Uh, as a function of the amount of solute. So remember, we want this temperature to be as high as possible because we want a window between this non-recrystallization temperature and the AR3. We want this wide so we can roll or do deformation, right? So, okay, so you, and um, that's one thing. So this has to be uh, TNR has to be high and the second thing is we want to have as little alloying addition as possible right because costs yes um, well you see here niobium um, at, at less than 500 ppm I can get uh, the TNR temperature to reach almost 1150 yes? so that gives me a big window uh, to do the finishing rolling in non-recrystallization conditions. Hmm? I, titanium and vanadium have a similar effect, but it's much, much less stronger, much less strong. So that means I will have to add a lot more of these elements uh, to get a similar effect. Hmm? Okay, so again, what, what's the trick if of this... Um, uh, controlled rolling, yes, is to have a, a big distance between the non-recrystallization temperature and the AR3 temperature. So I can do the rolling in this, in this, um, at this temperature. And when I do this, instead of having a recrystallized gamma grain, I get pancake grains, yes, with deformation bands inside. And when we nucleate alpha, I get lots of nucleation, very high nucleation density, and a very small grain size, okay? So strength, yeah. Strength with a very low amount of alloying and a um, um, uh, very low amount of uh, alloying and also a, um, um, a precipitation hardening 
and uh, grain size reduction giving me all the strength. Hmm? So I, I don't have to add carbon to do this, get the strengthening. Um, one thing that's important is for the niobium carbide itself, the precipitation hardening um, occurs mainly when we go from gamma to alpha um, uh, stability range because there we have a, a large drop in solubility for the carbides. Okay? And so very often uh, we get uh, precipitation of the um, carbides at the um, ferrite austenite uh, phase boundary. Get these trails of very small particles. Okay. We also want to very often you can uh, um, keep the, the the structure, make the structure even finer. Yes, by using not only combination, not only a controlled rolling, but also accelerated cooling. Yes, and in accelerated cooling, yes, instead of having uh, HSLA steel with a smaller grain size that will have a ferrite perlite uh, structure, I, by accelerated cooling I can obtain ferrite plus bainite microstructure, HSLA steel with that microstructure, or even bainitic uh, microstructures with that are uh, HSLA uh, steels. Yes. Okay, so let's have a look at some uh, properties here. Hmm? So um, this is a comparison here. This is a structural steel, S235. So as you know, structural, 235 means 235 megapascal of uh, yield strength, yes. And here, uh, compared to a structural steel, uh, this is again the European uh, standards, yeah? so it's a 460 megapascal strength material, yes. Uh, you can see it's microalloyed because it has an M here, yes. And you can see uh, uh, the compositions, so it's, it doesn't have, uh, it has more carbon but not as, uh, you know, still less than 0.1 carbon, yes. And, um, and what's very important here is the niobium additions. Hmm? Okay. Uh, typical uh, properties, for instance, for a steel um, like this. This is for a, a, a standard constructional steel. Standard constructional steel. Um, you can see here the yield strength, tensile strength, elongations, yes. And here for a HSLA steel. Yeah? And you can see uh, that we get, uh, despite the, uh, the large increase in strength, yes, here, so here about 400 megapascal, here we're about 150 megapascal higher, but the total elongation, yes, oops, excuse me, the total elongation is still. Um, pretty good, eh? 20%. Okay, and this is this is a comparison here. This this would be a standard carbon manganese steel, yes. Um, and you can see very large grain sizes, yes. This is an HSLA steel, yes. Much finer grain sizes. All right. The so again, what is important here with HSLA steel? Yes, if you look at this whole patch uh, diagram, it's the fact that it extends the whole patch equation to lower grain sizes. Yeah? So basically, um, if, if you don't use um, controlled rolling and accelerated cooling, you, you, you can't achieve these grain sizes. Okay? Even if, if you, uh, you know, if, if you know, so, so with carbon manganese steels, you cannot go here, yes, because you cannot refine the grain size, okay? And again, so what's important here is if you look at the contributions to the strengths of HLSLA steel, is you see that the contribution of perlite is, is much smaller, yes, is much smaller. 
And that's, that's because we have much less, or we, we, have, we don't need to rely on carbon for the, um, for the strength, okay? So some examples here about uh, uh, the, uh, the strength, uh, the composition first of a number of uh, steels. Yeah? So what, what you see here, yes, typical uh, carbon contents, yes, niobium contents, yes. And um, so what I want to um, uh, have your attention for is the fact that so I increase the the strength from this grade to this grade yes the 315 grade to the 460 grade and there is barely increase in the carbon content yes? so I go from uh, 800 ppm to about 1000 ppm so only 200 ppm of carbon more yes and, and so the, the, the strength level is not achieved by the carbon. It's achieved partly by increasing the manganese content. It's about doubled here, yes. And it's thermomechanical processing, yes. Thermomechanical processing. Okay. Um, and here you can see uh, typical uh, properties. Uh, let's look uh, here. So you go from 400, typically 400 to um, close to 600, yes, and elongations um, typically uh, 20 and then 15 percent as you uh, reach strength levels close to um, 500. Hmm? Right, and, and there is a long, long list of some extra uh, data on other um, uh, strengths of steels. But very important here is the carbon content is low and you have niobium and part of the increase in the strength is achieved by uh, solid solution strengthening with manganese. Okay? Okay. Right. So this, this is just data, lots of data. Okay, so uh, with HSLA steel w we have a steel that's reasonably formable, yes? And that gives me strengths uh, with, that can reach um, 600 megapascal. Hmm? Okay, uh, is that enough? Not really. We'd like to go higher. We'd like to go to uh, 600. We'd like to go to 800. We'd like to go to 1,000. Yes. Then um, the remember. HSLA steel is based on reducing the grain size, yes? Um, and so we've already done our very best to reduce the grain size, yes, um, uh, of the ferrite. Hmm? Uh, but there's a like, a, like a limit, yes? So we, the 600 uh, megapascal. So the only way we have to uh, continue increasing the strength is either go to other microstructures, so we go to bainite microstructure or martensitic microstructures, yes? or we use multi-phase microstructure. And the first one that's, uh, that's very, uh, been very successful is the du uh, dual-phase microstructure, uh, where we have ferrite and martensite, a mixture of ferrite and martensite. Mm -hmm. um, and there we can keep the idea of very low carbon contents, so less than 0.1 carbon, yes. But because we have an extremely strong uh, component in the microstructure, the martensite, we can also achieve very high strengths, yes. And surprisingly enough, yes, um, without much loss in, uh, in formability. And with dual phase steels today, we can get close to a gigapascal of formable steels, yes? So um, this is the microstructure, so you have ferrite, yes, ferrite here, and then these uh, brighter areas are martensite, yes? Um, 
And if uh, you look at the microstructure here in, in a TM, you see that you got your ferrite grains, yes? And you've got martensite islands, yes? yes? And at the boundary between the two, there seems to be a larger uh, density of dislocations, yes? Which are transformation dislocations. Where do they come from? When, well, when you, we'll see in a moment how we form the martensite, when the martensite forms um, from austenite, there is a big volume change, about 4% change in volume. And so the ferrite that's surrounding the, uh, the martensite is plastically deformed. It's plastically deformed. So you get a lot of uh, dislocations are created. Yeah? So high dislocation density in ferrite grains uh, are due to the martensite transformation. So if I look at a uh, tensile specimen of dual phase steels, so I basically have a microstructure with little islands of uh, martensite, yes? yes? And this martensite is surrounded by dislocations, yeah? And this martensite is also uh, surrounded by a um, because it expands when it's formed, yes, it puts the, uh, the ferrite around it under compression, compressive uh, stresses, hydrostatic compressive stresses, yes. All right. Um, and, and what is important here is, in particular, because we have mobile dislocations, yes, the DP steels even though they have about 800 ppm of carbon, they don't have yield points, or they don't have yield point elongations. And the reason is, the carbon is all in the martensite, and you have, around the martensite, you have lots of mobile dislocations. Yeah? So there is no pinning of these dislocations by the, um, the, the, the carbon, which is in the martensite, and so you get a material that doesn't have a yield point, although it has 800 ppm or thereabouts of carbon. So let's have a look at the uh, typical composition. Again, these compositions um, uh, are, are very lean, yes? So we don't add uh, Anything that's not really needed in the micro in the in the composition. So let's carbon is typically less than 0.1 percent, hmm? and it will be used to harden the martensite. Yes. How, how does it work? I mean, if you have I, I, because I told you it's, if you add mar if you if you want to have hard martensite, you need you, you you don't need to have martensite only. You need to have lots of carbon in the martensite. Yes. But if this 0.1% of carbon is actually put in the martensite only, yes, and say I only have 10% of the volume is martensite, that means that I will, the carbon content in the martensite will be 10 times 0.1, yes? So I will have a very high, I can make a very high carbon martensite in dual phase steel. Yes, and, that, and, and so that phase will be very hard. Hmm? Um, of course, um, when I have a lot of carbon in the martensite, I, it will have an impact on the toughness. Um, the carbon, the selection of carbon, we'll see that in a moment, will also determine the fraction of martensite I can make in the microstructure. And of course, we try to keep it as low as possible, yes, to keep uh, the material nicely weldable. Manganese in the microstructures, um, is a gamma stabilizer. We'll see we need to have austenite. It also improves the hardenability of uh, the austenite uh, 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 from which I make the martensite. It reduces the carbon activity and it strengthens the uh, ferrite. We also add silicon. Hmm? Silicon is an alpha stabilizer. Oops, it increases the uh, carbon activity. It generates more polygonal uh, 
ferrite, or that's because it's an alpha stabilizer. And um, reasons why we like to add it is because it avoids connected martensite particles. Mm -hmm. um, you'd like to have the martensite islands to be isolated. Mm -hmm. And it's also a solid solution strengthening element. Phosphorus uh, can sometimes be added to strengthen ferrite, solid solution hard, uh, yeah, um, hardening. And then there will be additions of small additions of chromium and, and or moly to DP steels. And that's because, again, we're trying to make martensite. We need to have uh, a, a hardenable austenite. Yes? And, we all, and we certainly don't want perlite. So that will also help um, with the carbon. So, so this is an example here, uh, dual phase steel compositions, uh, a, a dual phase steel uh, here, another one here. This is for hot roll dual phase steels. Um, carbon contents of a, uh, so, so what, what, we, what we basically have is a, you start with a, a a standard DP, uh, sorry, carbon manganese steel, right? And so it'll contain 0.1% uh, carbon, 0.25% of manganese. We add um, additions, dual phase steel additions. That will be mainly chromium in this case, yes? And some silicon, yes? Uh, for hardenability. And very often we uh, we also need to stabilize the, the nitrogen. Remember, uh, I said uh, we don't have problems with uh, the carbon, but we may have problems with the nitrogen. So um, in the case of hot roll DP steel, we will add some titanium. Uh, this is another concept here. This is uh, the base steel has uh, somewhat less carbon, half a percent of manganese, and the DP additions are again silicon, a little bit of chromium, a little bit of phosphorus. So depending on um, the, uh, the choices that a designer make, you will get, um, you may have slightly different compositions, yeah? Okay, so how do we make, yes? How do we make a DP steel? Yeah? All right, well, it's very, it's relatively simple. Hmm? So let's start with a steel. We'll just look at a, iron carbon phase diagram. Actually, this is an iron carbon phase diagram with, I think, about half a percent of manganese. So that would be the phase diagram for a, it, it's a, a pseudo-binary phase diagram for an iron manganese um, uh, steel, carbon steel. Yes. So, so we have, say we have 0.1 percent of carbon. Yes. Okay. We'll keep it simple. We'll start first with cold rolled material. Yeah? So you have cold rolled material and you want to turn this, uh, and it has 0.1% uh, of carbon, you want to turn it into a dual phase steel. Okay? So what you do is um, you're going to put it in a continuous annealing furnace because it's difficult to make DP steel in a uh, batch annealing furnace. You heat it up. Okay? You heat it up. And now the trick is you intercritically anneal it. You, so you don't anneal in the ferrite region. You don't anneal in the austenite region. But you anneal in the intercritical region, you know, where you have two phases, ferrite and austenite. And you stop here at 750. What happens at this temperature is you should get, remember, your physical metallurgy courses, you should have ferrite phase with this carbon content and austenite with this carbon content. Yes? Okay. And uh, the amount of the uh, phase fraction of austenite is given by this length divided by this length. Yes, and if you, if you uh, do the, uh, the analysis, it corresponds to about 10 volume percent of austenite, okay? Okay, what's the next step? Yeah. Next step is I cool this down rapidly, yes? I cool it down rapidly. What happens? Well, I cool down rapidly. Because the carbon content has increased 
in the austenite, yes, the material is now hardenable. I can make martensite. So if I cool down rapidly at around 250 degrees C, the, the transformation to martensite starts yes, and finishes because the MF temperature is also above room temperature. Yes? Okay. The amount of carbon uh, that I have here is 0.6. And so I need at least 0.6% of carbon to, to get this right. And uh, so in um, the, um, now, now this is the phase diagram. So that's the equilibrium phase diagram, right? Okay, so what happens when I do the, um, I, I look, I design the process, I have to look at the TTT diagram, yes? So, I, and of course, I have to look at the TTT diagram of this phase, yes? This phase, N not, the f not this phase, right? That's because that's, that's not the one that transforms, I have to look. So, okay, so now what I do, is this austenite here. I have to cool it down fast enough so I avoid formation of bainite and formation of ferrite. Mm? And, and so this is one of the reasons why I add the chromium, yes, to avoid um, uh, ferrite and bainite formation and get a material that's harnable, yes. And then once I'm under MS temperature, I can just um, I don't have to continue cooling down very quickly. I can cool down uh, a bit uh, less quickly hmm, to room temperature. Hmm. Okay. All right. Now, can we only make a dual phase steel by intercritical annealing? No. You can make a dual phase steel during hot rolling. Yeah. Mm, so for during hot rolled, hot rolling. So you can make a hot rolled DP steel. Mm? So how does this work? Well, again, uh, so uh, we look in this case at TTT uh, diagram, right? So, so we start with austenite coming out of the finisher. Mm? So the, 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 the tandem mill of the hot strip mill, yes? You come out of the finisher, you have, you've just rolled it, it's fully austenitic, it contains 0.1% of carbon, okay? So what do we have to do first? Cool down very quickly? No. First, you have to keep the temperature at around 850 yeah, degrees, yeah, so that you form some ferrite. Hmm? So that you form close to 90% of ferrite, yes? Once that is done, you have to cool down quickly, yes? To the coiling temperature, yes? Hmm? So that you are below the MS temperature. Yes? Okay? You understand? So you cannot do a continuous cooling. You have to do a stepped cooling. Yeah? First transformation to ferrite, then uh, cool down to the MS temperature. Yes? And when, when the material is coiled, you, do, uh, you, you complete the transformation to martensite. So let's have a look here. The uh, same thing. Yes, uh, uh, but um, with a little bit more explanation here. Mm -hmm. So I cool down my austenite, yes, right, to below the AR3 temperature. So the AR3 temperature on this diagram would be somewhere here, right? This AR3 temperature. Yeah. That's the temperature below which the ferrite formation starts, right? So in, in this range, I. I'm in the range of ferrite plus austenite, if I, if I have the step in the cooling at this range. So this temperature sets the amount of 
austenite or the amount of um, martensite, yes? What, why is that? Here, this temperature here. When you decide what this temperature is, you automatically decide how much, what the volume fraction is of your uh, ferrite and austenite. Right? Okay? Okay, and then I cool down, yes? to DMS temperature, uh, that's slightly, it's bet between 200 and 300 degrees C. Yeah? So that means I have to cool down quickly and very low, yes? 300 degrees C. Remember, um, for low carbon steels, aluminum killed low carbon steel or titanium, what was a low temperature of cooling, or 550 when we want to keep, for instance, aluminum nitride in solution, Yes, here you have to do considerably lower, 300 degrees C. Yeah? But once you are below 300, you can, you can cool down slowly because uh, the martensite transformation can occur slowly in the coiled, in the coiled uh, material. Okay, so we can make DP steels by um, uh, continuous annealing or by uh, dual... Um, uh, or by hot rolling, yeah? okay? And, and so our material, the properties that, that we get are basically ferrite and martensite, and you, you get, uh, you get a um, composite behavior, yes? The martensite is really very, very strong, right? So, so you, you're looking at a, um, a uh, so if you look at the, the contributions to the strength of the martensite, yes? Um, the main contribution are the dislocations, the very high dislocation density in the martensite and the carbon content. Because what we're basically doing when we're making martensite, we're, we're pumping all the carbon in the martensite. So it's very, very hard, yes? And it's got strength values here calculated, it's close to get 2 gigapascal hmm? and more. Hmm? The ferrite in, in, in uh, comparison is really soft. Yes? So you can see different contributions to the strength. Hmm? So when you deform the material, there is a very large partitioning of stress and strength. Hmm? Ferrite does most of the uh, deformation hmm? and the martensite is the load carrying uh, phase. Right, so let's have a look at some, um, some typical uh, dual phase steels that are, that are very widely used nowadays. Uh, DP500, DP550, DP600, yes. Um, very large elongations despite the strengths, yes. Even here, um, an HSLA steel at that l amount of strength doesn't have doesn't have near this uh, elongation, yes, has about half of it, yeah. So you get a material that's indeed very formable also. Yeah. Okay, and, the, and so here we have a number of um, standards here. Again, um, uh, so you can have uh, strength levels uh, around <coughs> tensile strengths of 450, yes, all the way up to twice that level, hmm? 900, 980, close to 1 gigapascal, yes, and you still have some elongation um, at these very high uh, levels. Yeah? All right, so is that the limit? Yeah? Is that the limit? Can we... Um, can we um, expand this uh, DP I uh, idea uh, further? Yeah? Well, one of the, the, the things we can do is instead of um, having small islands of martensite, yes? is to make a steel where you have small islands of carbide-free bainite, okay? okay? 
what is carbide-free bainite? Well, so first of all, uh, the steels that we make this way are called transformation-induced plasticity steel, or for short, trip steels. Trip. Trip steels make use of a phenomenon that's called the trip effect. Yeah? It's transformation-induced plasticity steel. And if we look at the microstructure, it's actually very similar to the, it looks a little bit different, but it's actually very similar in concept of, uh, as the DP steel. So you have ferrite, yes, and then you have, you can see other um, uh, smaller phase, islands of another phase throughout the microstructure. Hmm? And so if you look at this, uh, this finer, um, and the, the finer structure of this, these islands, this is what you see. So instead of seeing something that's homogeneous, yes, you see this kind of microstructures. And, and, and this microstructure, hmm, this phase, that's called bainite, it comes from carbide-free bainite. So it's a, it's a type of bainite but as the word says it, it's carbide free. Hmm? And it consists of two phases. It consists of bainitic ferrite, yes? And, so that's the dark phase here, yes? And it consists of retained austenite. So that's this uh, brighter phase here, yes? Okay? So let's, in, and in order to, to really grasp the structure, yes, of this carbide-free bainite, we will look at, for instance, this part of the microstructure in a TM, yes? And this is what you see. This is, this is such a microstructural constituent, yes? And, and this is this thing here, yes, that is carbide-free Bainite. And it consists of lats. You see these lats here. It, you can't see them very well, but there's some lats here. There's a lot of lats here, yes. You've got lats of bainitic ferrite. It's basically lats of ferrite, yes, that are free of carbon. There's no carbon in these, um, these lats, yes. Where's the carbon? The carbon is all in this retained austenite, okay? And because there is a lot of carbon in the austenite, it does not transform. It does not transform to martensite. So the islands we get in our trip microstructure are not martensite, but are bainite, but a special type of bainite, carbide-free bainite. And it's an unusual type of bainite because, um, uh, be, because it doesn't have carbide, a, a carbon, and um, carbides, excuse me. And um, the, the, the way it's uh, being done, the trick, huh, to, uh, to avoid carbide formation is by silicon additions. You know that silicon is, suppresses uh, the formation of carbides, yes? And so we make use of this in these trip steels to make carbide-free bainite. So how does this work and why does it work and why do we do this? Why do we even care, yes? Well, in, so again, we look at this, um, stress uh, this uh, tensile bar here and we now there are now islands in this microstructure yes and they're small islands of retained austenite so this phase yeah? so th this phase here in the TM or this white phase here in the SEM that's the same phase yes okay and what happens if I strain this yes? well wh when I strain this I get the trip effect and the trip effect is very simply the martensite, excuse me, the, the um, uh, austenite transforms to martensite. And we call this effect 
strain-induced transformation, yes? And why is this important? Well, what happens when austenite transforms to martensite? I get a high-carbon martensite instead of what used to be there, high-carbon austenite. It's much, much stronger than the phase it replaces. Yes. Second, there is a volume increase. Yes. So any place where the material was thinking of developing a neck, necking, yes, any necking is instantly suppressed. The material expands and strengthens. So this deformation zone stops to deform instantly. Okay, so we have a material now that is very resistant to necking. And what is necking? Well, necking is the end of uniform elongation. So by having this trip effect, yeah, I can extend the region of uniform elongation. I basically have a material that has a very good plastic uh, deformation uh, potential despite the fact that it's really strong. Why is it strong? Well, because as I deform the material, I'm replacing all this, the austenite, soft austenite, by very hard martensite. So I'm, I'm basically making a DP steel as we go. Yeah, so that's a very clever mat oops, material. So how can we make something like this? Yeah. Uh, well, well, let's look at a phase diagram first. Okay. Um, in the case of trip steels, we start with a little bit more carbon. Yes? A little bit more carbon. 0. 0.15, between 0. 0.1 and 0. 0.15 is enough. Um, but the example here is 0. 0.2. So what do I do? I take this material, and again, instead of annealing it in the ferrite region or in the austenite region, yes, I go intercritical, intercritical temperature. And in this case, so not only do I have a slightly higher carbon content for tripsias, I also have a slightly higher annealing temperature, about 800 degrees C instead of 750 for DP steels. Again, this is not an excessive temperature. IF steels are routinely annealed at 800 degrees C, so you don't have to make a special uh, uh, annealing furnace or something. Okay. So you have here, at this temperature, you make ferrite and austenite, yes? And you have about 50-50, 50, 50. 50 volume percent of austenite and 50 volume percent of uh, ferrite. Okay, now, now what do I do? I, I cool it down. I cool down. Of course, I don't cool down all the way because I have, you know, if I would to, were to do this, I would start making martensite, right? So I, I'm not doing this. I'm stopping at 400 and I'm letting the bainite transformation proceed, yes? During this bainite transformation, I form bainite. It's basically ferrite, yeah, my, but they're lat, lat-like, yes? And then austenite. And during this process, all the carbon goes into the retained austenite, yes? And it goes, it does this until we hit the T0 line, yes? Then as you know, the bainite transformation stops, yes? At that time, and so in this particular case, yes, the amount of carbon in the retained austenite has increased to close to 1.3%. That's a huge amount. So when I cool this down, what happens? to the austenite, nothing. It, why? 
because the MS temperature is below room temperature. It's below room temperature. So nothing happens, and I'm left with a microstructure that contains ferrite, bainite, and retained austenite. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, let's um, continue this discussion on formable um, high-strength steels um, next Tuesday. And uh, let's stop here. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>